producer for the TV discussion program, Let's Talk. His journalism has been honored by the Royal Television Society and also by the Association of European Journalists. In fact, in 2005, he was himself named Northern Ireland Journalist of the Year, and he became BBC Northern Ireland's political reporter in 2009. We're absolutely delighted, Stephen, that you're here. Thank you. Our guest speaker tonight is Baroness May Blood, who was born and brought up in Belfast. She worked in a linen mill from the 1950s until 1989, when she, where she soon became an active member of the Transport and General Workers Union and a shop steward. During this time, she was involved in creating a women's committee in the trade union and promoting equality for women at work. Since 1994, Baroness Blood has been an information officer of the Greater Shanko Partnership and is a founding member of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition. She was appointed a member of the a member of the Order of the British Empire, an MBE, and in 1995, in the 1995 birthday honours list in recognition of her work in labour relations. And in 1999, she became a life peer. In 1998, she was awarded an honorary degree from the University of Ulster, which was followed by another from Queen's University in Belfast, and the third from the Open University uh, in 2001. Baroness Blood uh, has many achievements. She was chair for both early years Belfast, uh, in fact one of the founders of that, and Bernardo's Northern Ireland Committee from 2000 to 2009. She's been an extraordinary advocate as campaign chair to the Integrated Education Fund in Northern Ireland, helping raise millions of pounds for this cause. She is an author herself in 2007. She published her autobiography, Watch My Lips, I'm Speaking. Baroness Blood, it's a real pleasure to Thank welcome you. you to the St. Patrick Centre on behalf of the audience here and, and uh, the staff and board. Thank you. The format for this evening is the same as last month, if anyone was with us. We have about 45 minutes of conversation and there will be an opportunity for us to ask some questions which will be invited by Stephen at the end. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hand you over to Stephen. Tim, thanks very much indeed. Gosh, after those introductions, we've got a lot to live up to, haven't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Baroness, lovely to have you Pleasure. here and uh, thank you very much for uh, those kind remarks and it's nice to be back in Dan Patrick again and apologies to those of you who were expecting my colleague uh, Gareth Gordon so I'll try and do my best Gareth Gordon impression over the next hour or so. Um, tonight we're going to talk about your life story, uh, your faith, growing up in Belfast, uh, St Patrick and, and, and I suppose your, your hopes and fears uh, for the future. Let's just touch on your, your childhood, what, what was it like growing up in the Shankill? I didn't grow up in the shack. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'm very often introduced as a shack and road woman, but I'm not a shack and road woman. I was born in off the Grosvenor Road. I was born in the of the Royal Victoria Hospital. I was born into a family of seven. Mum and Dad, there was nine of us, little two up, two down. And, uh, you know, we talk about, today we talk about poverty, but in those days, poverty was a real thing. And you know, I can remember my earliest memory is uh, probably my mother making enough dinner for the people down the street because their father wasn't working and mine was. I grew up in a, in a mixed area, which we call today Protestant Catholic. We Catholic lived next door to us. But I had a very happy childhood. Even though we were poor, we didn't know we were poor. Everybody had the same as us, so therefore there was nothing to be jealous about. And I grew up in a, a family where, and I very often ask about my mum and dad and were the religious. I grew, I grew up in a family where I wouldn't say the Bible was too often read, but the trade union rule book was. <laughs> so trade unions early on were a big part and parcel of your life? Yeah. My, my father was, uh, he worked in the shipyard all his life, part in the two world wars when he went away to fight. And uh, trade union was everything. My father believed that you didn't judge a person by their religion, by their color, or anything like that. He believed people were people and should be judged accordingly. And uh, I remember him telling me that uh, 
he believed that Jesus Christ was a communist because <laughs> Jesus Christ said the world belonged to everybody <laughs> and that's what he believed and uh, you know in our house yes we were we went to Sunday school my mum sent us out to Sunday school uh, we went to church and you know again I very often say this when I'm out we went to church regularly during the week because it was the community center it's where you went it's where things happened where we had our youth club where we had the, the, the different reinformed organizations and so the church was very much a center of my life even though it might have been at home and it's interesting you you, you talked about your your dad and training unionism people talk often about the link between christianity and socialism would would, would there have been those kind of discussions in your no, household not as far as my father was concerned no as far as my father was concerned uh, religion was a no-no right it was, it was a division that divided divided people up he didn't believe in it at all and uh, i was saying about the trade union being a big thing in my in my family life uh, when i went to work first and i know you'll come on to that i got strict instructions from my father that i was not to join the trade union why not my father believed trade union for men <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of fun <laughs> And did your mum have similar beliefs to your dad in terms of trade unions and if No, 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 no. My mother didn't take any art in her part in that kind of a conversation. There were seven of us and him and her and my mother found trying to look after name was enough. She didn't uh, think about other things. So no, my mother never would have discussed the trade union or anything like that. And to my knowledge she was never in a trade union. But uh, according to my father's instruction I shouldn't join. But I wasn't half an hour in the middle of the joint. <laughs> <laughs> and were there discussions? I mean, you're a very political person. You, you've spent a lot of your politi political life in and around trade unions, in and around community groups. So you have that sense of yeah. community spirit. But, and you've obviously, you obviously picked some of that up as a very young person. But would there have been those kind of discussions with your dad at all? Oh, yes. Well, it wouldn't have been around religion. My father would have talked about inequality. My father never could understand, and I was saying this, I was at the City Hall in Belfast on Sunday there at an event, and I was saying, I remember a time as a child, I would be allowed in the back gate of the City Hall, up the steps, and you paid the gas bill and come back out again. That's the way life was then. My father absolutely hated that, and my father thought there should be equality right across the board. Although, in a quirky sort of a way, I don't think his, his equality views included women. <laughs> it was mostly equality. But that's not real equality. It was, well, then is mine. It was equality among men and the women just done what they were told. No. <laughs> but he believed that life could be better and you can make life better by what you do. Oh yes, my father believed that if you had a talent, you, you, you used it to the best of your ability. Now, it's not that he was greatly interested in education. Because when I was 11, I'd done the dreaded selection process we talk so much about today, and I passed it. And I wanted to be a school teacher. I hated school, absolutely hated it. But I wanted to be a school teacher because from a very early age, I realized the teacher had power. And I thought I'd like some of that. <laughs> now, I remember coming home and telling my dad that I was doing this exam, it meant nothing. And when the form came to fill in to what school he wanted me to go to, I wanted to go to Methodist College and then into Stranmillis. He want, he put down Grosvenor High. Why? Grosvenor High was out our back door. <laughs> so he figured I wouldn't need to go on a bus or anything. I could just go across what we called the Black Pad and end the school. He wasn't interested in that side. My father was very much, well, he was into equality. And my, my father was very much a man's man, very much. And there were, were there any discussions about faith? at all you you, you you touched earlier about your, your father's view and you touched earlier about sunday school i mean what about faith what was well i think you i was reared in a time when as i say our life revolved around church sunday school and even i lived in a mixed area even the catholics in our area came to our sunday school why because it was a free christmas party and it was a free outing in the summer <laughs> people very quickly learned there's certain things you can do and can't do. And I was, I was quoting the other day, I remember probably my first experience of cross community work. I don't like the title, but that's what it's called today. Uh, I remember 1948, the Americans sent big, big boxes of red apples to primary school children in Belfast. And we had to go down and we got two. I never seen as big a red apples. And I went over and got the little Roman Catholic fella that lived facing me, Jerry McHugh. 
Off we went to Sandy Road, where I went to school. We got two apples each. We brought them home, left them in the house, and I went to Tim to St Paul's and got two more. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as, as far as faith in that was concerned, as far as the Bible was concerned, as I say, my mother would have encouraged us to go to church and, and, and all that, but it wasn't talked about in the house. And I can't ever remember... I can't ever remember my father going to church. But it was just accepted, that's what you do. You go, yeah. to, you go to Sunday school. That's the way that's, it was. Yeah. That was just accepted yeah. as part of the community. Yeah. And, and when you were a little girl, you, 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 did you think about what you wanted to do? You, you touched on a moment ago about possibly being a teacher? or Yes, I, I wanted to be a teacher because I considered the teacher had the power. And from a very early age, it must have been something in me wanted that power. Uh, I can remember, although it didn't work out that way, because when I passed the 11 plus, my dad put Grosvenor High down. Grosvenor High accepted me, and I said, no, definitely not. I want to go to Methodist. Again, a very stubborn streak. I probably got that from my father. Mm -hmm. And I can remember going to this little school in Sandy Row, and Blaze Street in Sandy Row, and wasting the next four years of my life. I hated school. And very often when I'm out of, out of school, praise giving and that, I say to the kids, I had a great relationship with my principal. I seen him every day in the week. Because <laughs> I was generally sitting outside his office waiting for him. I hated school with a passion. Why, why did you hate I, I think I, I just could never see any sense in it. And maybe, that, maybe that's wrong. But Were you a rebel? Yes. <laughs> and the four day before I left school, the assistant principal sent for me. I left school at the age of 14. And the assistant principal sent for me and she said to me, you're a hussy and you'll never be anything else. Only a hussy. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember running all the way home. I thought it was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I think at that time, I think the... Did that, that teacher didn't see you become a member of the House of Lords? No, I no. think that teacher seen me as a troublemaker. Yeah. And I have, I've spent the last 40 years trying to prove her right. Yes, okay. Yeah. Well, we need troublemakers sometimes. Absolutely. We need troublemakers. If I don't make trouble, Stephen, nobody remembers us. Oh, absolutely. We need troublemakers. <laughs> Um, it would have been quite nice if that teacher had seen you in the House of Lords. Wouldn't, wouldn't, that, just, wouldn't that be lovely? Wouldn't have been lovely. You could have said, how's this for a little hussy? She's long dead. <laughs> but as I say, you know, in, in latter years of my life, I've been honoured so many times, as Tim was saying, I have three honorary doctorates in the House of Lords. That's not bad for a hussy. That's not bad for somebody left school at 14. Not bad. Yeah, that'll do for you. Yeah, yeah. And what happened at 14 then? Talk me through. At 14, uh, my mother was a cook. And I didn't know that my mother died. I didn't know my mother couldn't read and write. Right. I never knew that. She used to go out every week and buy a, a magazine called Secrets. But she only looked at the pictures. I never knew my mother couldn't read and write. That's astonishing. Because when my brother was in England, she used to say, you write the letters, you're a better writer than I. But I just I thought that was the reason. But uh, my mother was a cook. My mother was a marvellous cook. But when did, when did you discover that she I, When she died. And how did you discover that? From her brother. I happened to say something about my mummy writing. He says, no, no. He says, Maisie is my mother's name. He says, Maisie couldn't write. And nobody told no. you that and you no. didn't twig? No, no. My mother was very clever. So how that. old were you when your mum died? 41. So for 41 years, you didn't know that your no, mum... No, I never knew my mother couldn't write. That is astonishing. But she was a marvellous cook. And I often wondered how she got around using recipes. It must have just thought... Well, she must have been a natural, but just watched. But she worked, in, she worked in Mackey's, uh, and she was a the, the cook in the director's office. And uh, she got me a job. I was leaving school at 14. She got me a job in Mackey's office, which in those days probably was very high prestige. Today, you know, sometimes we denigrate office staff. Nothing would work if you didn't have been office staff. And uh, for a fortnight, I was getting this job in a fortnight. The girl that was leaving wasn't going for a fortnight. And my mum, the day I came home on the Friday, my mother should get out and get a job for a fortnight. You're not sitting in the house. Mm -hmm. So Blackstaff's warehouse was at the top of our street, which is now part of the Royal Victoria Hospital. And I went up there and got a job. And I went in for a fortnight and I said 38 years. I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. What was so good about it? It was a community within a community. Once you went in through again, and I worked in a... In a a mill that was 75% Catholic, 25% Protestant, never come in did. Once you went through the mill gate, there was only one enemy, and that was the Gandalf Court. And we were out to make his life just as impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and working in a 40, 450 workers, of which roughly 400 were women. And uh, I worked in a room of 98 women and two men. 
I worked in the warehouse side, really at the rooms up. And uh, I often say, you know, uh, as women, we talk about sexual harassment. I tell you, we harassed those two <laughs> <laughs> That was great fun. <laughs> and you joined the trade union pretty early on. Yes, as I say, my dad gave me instruction not to join. I wasn't half an hour in the mill to somebody come up and says, we're all in the transport, are you joining? Well, I wasn't going to be the odd one out. And in those days, it was a shilling, five pence. So I reckon my dad didn't need to know. And he never knew for the first four or five years of my life that I was actually in the trade union because I never went to meetings or anything. You were just a union member. And then when I was 19, we had a particular dispute. The mill was a dreadful place to work. Conditions were appalling. And we certainly weren't there for the money. Uh, in the winter, you were frozen. In the summer, you were melted because it had a glass roof. And uh, the work was hard. And I remember that we had a particular dispute. The union officer came up and he was describing he said, now look, this, this company's getting away with murder, and I can't be here all the time. I have eight mills to look after. One time there was eight mills within that facility. And he said, so I always sit at the back and, and stand at the back. I think it's easier to heckle from the back. <laughs> and I made some remark, and he said to me, would you like to come up to the front and say that? So I went up to the front and said it. Everybody knew me. It was during the lunch hour. And uh, after the meeting was over, he said to me, you wouldn't like to be the shop steward? I said, you've got it in one, I wouldn't like to be in the shop Because <laughs> <laughs> I figured I'd have to come and tell my dad that. Like. And uh, he said, well, look, would you do it for a month? Now, I'm sure there's people in this audience tonight who knows that. You go to something and they're looking at a new chair person, or they're looking at a new... Say, you wouldn't do it for a month if we get something. No. And then 20 years later, you're still doing it. That's code. But when I went up to my, back to my place of work that day, my boss said for me, and he said to me, I understand you're going to be the new union rep. He said, well, everything will be done outside the gate. All money will be collected outside the gate. Any problems will all be dealt with outside the gate. And I remember coming out of his office that day and said, well, if he's that hot, worried about it, that's for me. <laughs> and I phoned up Mr. Man, Billy Man, and I said, Billy, I'll go ahead and be in the shop sure, but I know nothing about it. He says, I'll get you all the education you need. And thank God he did, because I owe any education I have to the Transport and Travel Workers Union. That really was a big moment in your life. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I went to our classes in the tech, and it was all men. Invariably, through my life, I've always felt that I've always been the only woman. And it was all men. But I used to watch those stewards and watch what they were doing and watch, watch what they were asking for. And I'll give you an example. I was, there was some stewards in uh, the class for Mitchell, which was a big company in those days. And they had been, there was a World Cup coming up and they wanted to watch it live, and the company says, no, 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 we can't stop the process. But what we will do, we'll video it, we'll let you watch it in the canteen afterwards, and we'll throw in a couple of crates of beer. That was it. They're going to be able to watch a, a football pitch, a football match, and drink beer. The day before I went to that class, I was in my director's office asking for what? Two more toilet rooms. Because in the room, as I say, there was 98 women in the room I worked in, and my boss thought four toilet rolls was more than sufficient. And when I went to see him about more toilet rolls, he says, why are you taking them home? <laughs> now, I wouldn't doubt some of them might have been. <laughs> and that taught me a whole lot of lessons. As women, we didn't ask for enough, and that pushed me on to do different things. And then how did your trade union role develop? Well, it developed in as much as through the education that they, the transport got me. I, I was, went on to the Wages Council for the, for the linen industry. I was on it for about 15 years. Uh, I started to speak at conferences. I started to get noticed. I started to be, put things forward. And more and more and more, you got more involved in things. And the trade union gave me the strength and also the education to push it forward. What did your dad think? My dad was a very unhappy man. <laughs> so he, was, he wanted to know what good that was going to do me. Yet he was a trade union. Oh yes, but he didn't have no women both. No, no. But did you ever convince him? Oh, I, think it, I think in a sneaky way he was proud. I think he probably but was he proud. he probably wasn't going to tell me. No. <laughs> I would never do. My father used to call me the big girl. Right. And uh, at the end, when all my brothers and sisters married and there was only mum and dad and me left, I used to hear him say, Mummy, we'll talk about that when the big girl goes out. <laughs> Were you the favourite? Oh, absolutely not. No, no. No, no, no. no. I know my oldest sister was the favourite. Right, and okay. my dad. Right. And one of my brothers was my mum's favourite. We knew that. Right. 
And um, what did your mum think of your burgeoning trade union career? My mum just thought it was absolutely wonderful. Mm. I was probably doing all the things she would have loved to have done. My mother worked in Gallagher's as a young woman. When she married, she had to get a job up. That was the law then. Mm. And she drifted from one job to another. As I say, she was a cook. She was a cleaner. She just went, she worked in the munitions during the war. And I think my mother just thought, good girl. And my mother used to say to me, if you think you can do it, go for it. That's good advice. Go for it. If you fall on your face, at least you try it. And did you feel at the time that you were this trailblazer? Oh, absolutely not. Many, many times I have to be perfectly honest, I felt out of my own depth. I wondered, my God, what have you got yourself into now? Because invariably I was always more or less in the company of men. So you were always competing. That was one of the reasons that we tried to set up a women's committee. I went on to the ruling committee of my union, was voted in. And you were there for two years, and one of the things I thought we should have a women's committee. And in a, in a funny way, it was, it was a step forward, but it was a step back. Because when we got a women's committee, the men said, right, we don't need to talk about them issues now, they can talk about it in their own week committee. And that's not what we wanted. We wanted to talk about it in our committee and put it through to the committee, the bigger committee, to get it done. I was on the ruling committee of my union for a number of years, but I was the only one. There was 23 men and me. And that's where the title of my book comes from. Because when I was on that committee, if I made a contribution to whatever we were discussing, they just looked down the table and went on talking. It was like as if somebody had opened the window and left the window. <laughs> and one day I was particularly angry and I hammered the table and I said, watch my lips, I'm speaking. <laughs> and they all looked down the table and that became my nickname. I was known in the transport union as watch my lips. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. It worked. It worked. It worked. <laughs> And I've been reading your book over the last week or so, um, and I was struck by the passage where you write about being made, re made redundant, and I couldn't get over the amount of money you were offered. Tell the audience about that. I worked in the mill for 38 years, and I was the longest MAP employee there when, when the mill closed in 1990, and I got £3,000 of redundancy. For 38 years? For 38 years. It's astonishing. And not only that, but we were made redundant and uh, because we were owned by an English company, we were told we couldn't draw employment benefit for 12 weeks. And I remember going to the uh, job centre, that's now called, we called it the Brew in those days. <laughs> I went to the Brew on the Shankle and I said to the manager, this can't be right. I mean, why give me £3,000 one hour and, and make me live for 12 weeks? And we says there's nothing can be done about it. And then I had a friend and she says to me, go to the brew on the falls and see what they say. And I went down and seen the manager on the, in the brew on the falls. And he said, give me all those details. And within a week we had her. We had her on the planet. It's amazing. We were only pure working class Protestants. Don't we care? But that guy got us our money. And then you started to get involved in the, in the local community. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was unemployed for eight months and you know, very often we hear and we talk about unemployment but until you've actually been unemployed, you have no idea the feeling, the whole feeling of nobody really cares, there's no value here. And I had applied for a number of jobs but obviously I wasn't going to get them because I was already known as a very trade unionist, uh, so I wasn't going to get a job. And uh, I remember going down to Snugville Street, the, the Peru, and the guy said to me, now, take a seat. He says, uh, what age are you? I says, I'm 52. He says, that's a real problem. I says, for you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you're too old to be trained, and you have no real industrial experience. What's the talk? I knew what he meant by two old uh, I knew what he meant by no industrial experience because I'd worked in textiles all my life and textiles to the dying industry. But how could you be too old to retrain? And he gave me a little white card and he wrote on it not to be recalled. And he says to me, Don't worry, I'll always get your benefit. And I came out that day and I remember standing on the Shanka Road and saying to myself, Is this my future? Is this, is this me? I could have been out doing community work from nine in the morning to God knows what time at night, but it wasn't paid employing. Nobody was valued by giving you a salary. And only those people who have been there would understand that. And I remember saying to myself, this can't be right. 
This just cannot be right. On the Sunday night, I got a phone call from a, a Roman Catholic woman I'd worked with on the peace line for a number of years. And she said, we're opening a new project on the Shankle, uh, in the Bodega Martin Road. And she says, we'd like you to manage it. I said, don't be stupid. Me manage it, I can't even manage myself. <laughs> the truth of the matter was, all my life, the guy in the white coat had been the enemy, and she was asking me to be that person. Yes. But she was very persuasive, and thank God she was, because it opened up a whole new world to me. And what was that new world? Well, the world was that you could make, you could make some kind of opportunities for people who, like myself, had been thrown on the heap. I learned that I had skills I didn't even know I had. I ran an office, I was able to do wages. Something I never even thought about, but it was, we had to do it because we didn't have the money to pay anybody. And so, and we employed uh, <coughs> 10 uh, men who were unemployed. They only got £10 on top of their benefit. They came in in the morning at half eight and they worked through to half four every day. And they made the most beautiful furniture. These guys were really all paramilitaries, ex paramilitaries, guys who had been thrown on the heat and told they were failures. When they came in, they discovered they had a skill to make the most beautiful wooden furniture or paint. A number of things, and we opened up that world to them. And I seen that change just taking place in many of those men's lives, and it just it just took me down another road. And that's a part of Belfast which has suffered oh, suffered yeah. an enormous amount during the troubles. What was that like? Dealing well, with that? I moved to the Shankill actually. Uh, the troubles broke out in '69 in the area that I was born in, and I often tell the story. It was uh, hilarious. We were we were one of the few areas in Northern Ireland that would be under curfew. And uh, on, the, on one side of the Robin Road was totally Catholic, this side was mixed, and uh, we lived on this side. So on the Saturday night, we were under curfew on a Friday, on the Saturday night, uh, my chum and I decided we would go to, we were going to Dundon to visit a friend. So we were working down, we were walking down the Stillery Street, if any of you know that area, and we heard a voice saying, return to your home. And my chum said to me, see them Catholics, they won't do one thing they're told. <laughs> and we walked on. And we heard the voice again saying, return to your home. Next thing, two police cars drove up. Try getting through the day. Two police cars drove up. And the sergeant said, he said, do you not know this area is under curfew? And my chum says, no, 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 we're Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I don't care what you are. You live in the Lower Falls. And I never knew till that day that I lived in the Lower Falls. <laughs> put me in one car, put her in the other, took us home. And he says, now you're not allowed out the Monday. And the interesting thing is, ladies, we all know, we say, oh, and I would love a day in the house. <laughs> not when you're not allowed out. <laughs> not when you're, but it was a really horrendous weekend. And uh, then uh, they came sometime after that, about a year later, they came to burn out our Catholic neighbours, next door audience. And my father went out and defended them. It wasn't right. Clear off, boys. These women, these women didn't stop doing any harm. She just ruined her family. And uh, they went away right now. But they came back a fortnight later and burned us out. <laughs> and I really feared for my father's life. And uh, we couldn't get a house anywhere. We were working class Protestants. We had no more benefits than anybody else. We couldn't get a house. My father was told he had enough points, even though he'd fought in two world wars. Not enough points. And uh, we went, my, my mother was reared in the Shankill, though she was born in Crumlin. And uh, we went to see Johnny McQuaid, who was a friend of my mommy's. Johnny McQuaid's a very famous alderman in Belfast. And Johnny says, I can't get you a house, Maisie. But they're building new houses at the top of the Springfield and Ballyga Martin Road. He says, why don't you go up and squat? Because the year before, the whole Catholic population in those houses had moved up. And the whole Protestants from Bell and Murphy and New Barclay had moved down. So it was a lot of vacant property. And we moved into a flat. And my mother thought she landed in Hollywood. <laughs> we had central heating. We had a bathroom. We had running water. <laughs> Things we had never, never in our lives had. And we moved in now. The whole estate it was only eight years old. Beautiful estate sitting right at the foot of the Black Mountain. It gets its name from the Springfield Road in the Ballyga Martin. That's why it's called Spring Martin. And uh, when we got there, it had been built with 800 dwellings. And when we got there, there was only 350 could have been lived in. They were absolutely destroyed. They were either burnt out or whatever. And kids were lighting fires and all. We moved into the flat and I decided to form a committee. So How old were you? I was 40, 40, 40, no, about 36 or 37, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I decided to form a committee and try and see could we turn the estate around because it had become a real dump. We had rats rolling about the estate as big as cats. 
because we couldn't get the bin men in. We were technically too close to the peace line, as they call it. And uh, it was really dreadful. People just went out. We had, we had a beautiful front and back garden. People just dumped in the back garden. And I have photographs at home where the rubbish was as high as the six foot rains. And rats were running everywhere. So we decided we would put a group together. We met in each other's houses. The committee had 12 women and one man. And I'm very often asked by feminists, why did you invite one man? <laughs> I said, it's really quite simple. He could write lovely letters and he could use a computer. <laughs> and we didn't have to either. And we met in each other's houses. We put a five year plan together to, to clean up the estate and to get away, get the dirty property taken out, get a shop, get a play, get a play park for children, and get a football pitch. And I remember taking this wonderful plan <laughs> down to uh, one of the people who were in charge, and they said to me, well, where's your business plan? I says, what's a business plan? <laughs> well, she says, they'll have to take us away and put in business, and they'll have to cost it. I says, how can I cost it? But how can I know what it would take? He says, well, it won't be accepted. Fortunately, through again, through my trade union connections, I had uh, a friend who could do that for me. Got the business plan, got it put forward, and Richard Needham was the minister at the time. We invited Richard Needham up, and people laughed. The powers to be said, don't be stupid, the minister doesn't go up to the peace line. But Richard Needham came, and Richard Needham said, every boat has to see it, as he seen it that day, they shouldn't have made a living. And gradually, the five-year plan that we had planned it took 10 years. We got, we got the whole estate cleaned up, all the dirt and property taken out. We got the houses renovated, we got a shop, we got a play, but we could never get a football pitch. And we got a football pitch in Spring Martin two years ago, 40 years after the last one. So sometimes things don't happen, but sometimes with a very determined, and in, in the estate at that time, we had both the paramilitary factions, we had the UVF and the UDA in the estate, and they had illegal drinking clubs. And they fought every day of the week. We didn't need to go for the peace line. They, some of the things that happened was dreadful. And as a committee of women, we decided, right, we're getting rid of them. And most of the, most of the women on my committee, their men drank in these clubs. So it was a very, but these women stuck it out. I remember we had one wee woman on our committee, it's a wee wee tiny person, and she went to one of these uh, flats that was an illegal drinking club, knocked the door, and this guy came out. Now she was so small, when he opened the door, she was actually looking at his belly button. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, what do you want? She said, we well, want you out. I okay and closed the door. Got when we kept that up night after night after night, we eventually got them out. So it is possible for, for ordinary people to make that difference, but it does take a lot of grit and a lot of sticking it in there and doing it. And I have to say at the time what disappointed me so great me was the churches really weren't interested. We couldn't get the churches interested at all. Why don't you think they were interested? I think it was too difficult. The paramilitaries was very open what they were doing and uh, the churches didn't want to know. And that really hurt me because I have a very strong faith. Was it natural after that that you would get involved in politics? No, it wasn't natural. Very often I'm asked why I never went into politics in Northern Ireland. I have to tell you the truth is I didn't want to be orange or green. I just didn't want to be either. But the Women's Coalition came. Calling. The Women's Coalition came and it came about in a strange way, Stephen, because in 1994 I was asked along with group to take 52 women from Ireland to a conference in Boston, all expenses paid. Now the ones from the south, they were handpicked, they were all professional women. In the north, uh, Patty May, whose wife was the Secretary of State's wife then, and she insisted we would have to advertise them. And with 32, we got 140 applications. But we got, fancy got down. Anyway, the 52 women went to Boston. And what, I went to Boston with a clear idea, politics is not for me. Not for me, definitely. I came back from Boston with a firm idea that if we were ever going to make real change in Northern Ireland, it would have to be political. And that was the reason a lot of us got together and the Women's Coalition came out of it. And I have to say, I never believed in a women's party. I don't believe in that at all. The world's men and women, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in a man's party or a women's party. But we needed women to the talks table because it was going to be all men who was going to decide our future. And so we, we and we were told, and I was told by an official unionist, that get away, women in Northern Ireland don't want into politics. We had 78 women put their name down to stand and we couldn't, we couldn't fill the forms in quick enough. 
and we got two women uh, elected to the talks, and those women went through the most horrendous physical and mental abuse, and I really mean that. It really was two years of torture. When they got up to speak, the political parties in the room used to cat call, whistle, sing, anything at all, and it was just, and then when they met them in the corridors, would give them a, a nudge. But we, we come up with an idea that we would name them and shame them. And the, the press, like yourself, used to come in and interview. And we, and we had a canteen and we said, right, we'll put your name on the wall. It soon stopped. It soon stopped, so it did. But the Women's Coalition would all the end of stand, as you know, for, for storming and the peace talks and were involved in the Good Friday Agreement and all that. The interesting thing about the Women's Coalition is, people very often ask me now, why is there no Women's Coalition now? The reason's quite simple. Women in Northern Ireland didn't vote for it. End of story. When I go out to talk to feminist groups that talk about they want women to do this and women to do that, here was an opportunity. If they wanted the women's party, here was an opportunity to do it. So the women's coalition gradually did it down. And I have to say, we had a lovely dinner one night, a lovely wake, and we buried it. <laughs> and someone said to me in the recent debacle when our storming was down for the three years, uh, do you think we should resurrect the women's coalition? I said, no, you can't do the same trick over again. We have to find another way to do it. There were heady days, weren't there? Oh, yeah. But having said that, I mean, at that time, these two women were on the talks table. Now, there were women in politics, I was aware of that, but they weren't at the front table. Now, today, if you look at Stormont today, we have 90 MLAs, of which 30% are women. Three of our parties is led by women. Now, if anybody had told me that 15 years ago or even, I would not have believed it. I would not have believed the DUP would have had a woman leader. Sinn Féin would have had a woman leader. I didn't be, but very often, very often they seen the Women's Coalition was taking a vote. So parties outside said, we better get in on this. But in terms of women's representation, there's still a lot more work to be done. Oh, absolutely. <coughs> but there were women who held the line. I mean, I, mean, I was thinking, for instance, the other day, I was thinking when Seamus Mallon died about Breeze Rogers. I mean, Breeze Rogers really held the line in the SDLP. So she did. And she was one of the few women that was willing to speak out. But there is still a lot of work to do. But uh, talking about, you know, 30% uh, of Stormont being female now, I heard a comedian saying recently, when Stormont was down, at least it proves equality works. What do you mean? He says, well, when the men were on it, it was a mess. Now the women are on it, it's still a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so he says that proves equality works. But yes, we, we will press on. We press on. Obviously, there's still a lot of need out. There's a lot of things to be done. I'm glad to see the assembly back. Hopefully, it'll, it'll, it'll remain for a while. How did your life change when you became a member of the House of Lords? Oh, my life changed entirely. As I said, in the late 90s, I've been honoured many, many times, and sometimes embarrassingly so, because I know lots of women have done the most courageous things and have never got a recognition for it. Many of them just happened to be in the frame. But, um, I, Mo Mo was a Secretary of State at the time, and Mo and I were great friends, had been friends even before she became a Secretary of State here. And Mo was always, during the peace talks, Mo was always asking me to do things in the background, to go into the prisons and make sure the loyalist prisoners get on board and all that kind of thing. And I got a phone call one morning from her PA to say he wanted to come up and speak to me. I thought it was something like that. He came in and he said, Nay, there's no easy way to say this, you're being offered a life period. I says, what's that when you're writing home? <laughs> he says, you're being offered a seat in the House of Lords. I says, what am I doing it? <laughs> I actually thought, stupid and ignorant. I thought you were going to get me a chair. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out how I was going to get it home and where it could fit in my house. But he explained what it was. And of course, it was such a huge honour. No woman in Northern Ireland had ever been considered for the House of Lords. That's how far our politics was all male. But um, I said yes, because I have enough about half to saying yes. Did you have to think about it for long? No, I said yes right away. I have one problem, Steve. People ask me to do something, I say yes. And then five minutes later, I go and say, oh my God, what did I say yes for? <laughs> but I said, do, do, you, do you consult with people? Is there any individual no, that you... No, no. When, when I was told this, I said yes right away. And then I went home and walked the floor all night. <laughs> my God, what had I done now? Me and my big mouth. In terms of decision making, is your gut reaction often right? So when you make a decision, you make a decision because, do you know what, that feels right. Yes. That feels and right. And I believe all my life, I have a very strong Christian faith, and I believe all my life God has opened doors. And I believe, sometimes it's been scary, like going into the House of Lords, I had no idea what I was going to do in the House of Lords. 
unlike Barnish Ritchie, who had, has had, had the experience of, <laughs> of working in Parliament. I had no idea. And I went in there, but you know, I just knew it was something. This was another door God had opened for me. This was just something more I could do for Northern Ireland. I wasn't there for myself. I was there to promote people in Northern Ireland. And then you had that tricky thing to do. You had to come up with a title for yourself. Yes, I mean, after I, I phoned, I said no, and I phoned the next morning and said no, and then uh, Chris said to me, and the Prime Minister, it was Tony Blair at the time, giving me three days to think about it. So I went away and I prayed. I knew it was what I should do. I rang him and said yes. And then I got a letter from a guy called Garter. And uh, if ever there was a pompous man in the system, <laughs> and then went over and he said, We know Lady Blood, we have to think about a title. And I said, No, I don't want a title. You have to have a title. Everybody has to have a title. The reason's really quite simple. You have to be Baroness Blood off somewhere for their records. Anyway, um, what did I know about setting the title? I had no idea what the man was talking about. And you weren't allowed to ask anybody. Because it was all a big secret, and I was told I couldn't talk about it. Tony Blair made it public. <coughs> So uh, I took a, you have to take a map over to uh, Garter. I took a map over. Now, on, when I, up until I wrote my book in, in there a few years ago, in 2007, I believed I was born beside the Blackwater River, which is where the West Link is now. It's actually the Black Staff River, but I thought it was the Blackwater River because the street was saying it was called Blackwater. And um, I said, there was a place on the map called Blackwater Town. I said, that'll do me. So my title was put down, Baroness Blood of Blackwater Town County Armagh. Try getting that on an envelope. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, on the shankle, it then became known that I'd been offered a, house, a seat in the House of Lords, and uh, they were taking bets on the shankle as to what my title would be. Would it be Baroness Blood of the shankle, Baroness Blood of Ballygamorton, Baroness Blood of White Rock? I have to, I have to be honest, if I didn't know I could take. Belfast, I would have been thrilled to take a Belfast in the city, but I didn't know, I had no idea. So I picked out this place, Blackwater Town, and it was put down the seal, and uh, the history of Blackwater Town is in 1969, when the troubles broke out, it was 99% Protestant, there was only one Catholic family lived in it. Today it's the exact opposite. And uh, when uh, my title was formally announced, I was sent for by our brigadiers, and he said to me, what on earth made you take a Republican hold at Blackwater Town? <laughs> I said, it's really quite simple. I'm claiming it back for the Protestant people. <laughs> now, that wasn't true. <laughs> they didn't have a sense to own. I have to say the people of Blackwater Town were thrilled. Just in case there's anybody in the audience from Blackwater Town, do you want to apologise? Yeah. <laughs> they were thrilled because I'll tell you why. Blackwater Town had a project then. Once they had a baroness, the project seemed to go on by leaps and bounds. Mm. I went up. And they gave me the most wonderful night. The whole, the whole place turned out. Isn't that nice? And it was wonderful and gifts and I, I stayed, meant to be. Yeah, I stayed friends with with someone for a number of years. But you know, that's my title, and I'm proud of it. And here in Down Patrick, I love to come to Down Patrick because I actually have a school here called after me, Blackwater Grade <laughs> School. <laughs> and it's called after me. I think you're secretly taking over large parts oh, of Northern oh, Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're doing it town yeah, by town, yeah, really. Yeah, right. The interesting thing about the school was when we moved them out, they were in temporary premises down in the old Beaver Hospital. When we moved them here, there, there was a whole thing about the name, would the Down Patrick be part of it? Of course, it was down high and all that. And then someone on the board says, Look, let's call it Blackwater Town after May Blunt. And actually, I'm rather proud that I have a school called after me. I tell my sister that and she just looks at me as if I'm not wise. I think that's rather lovely. <laughs> Um, you were mentioning uh, Down Patrick, and obviously we are here in Down Patrick. Let, let's talk a little bit about um, St. Patrick. Um, what does St. Patrick mean to you? Well, I was thinking about this when, when Tim very kindly asked me to come. I have to say St. Patrick has always been the saint of Ireland. Uh, personally, I don't know a great lot about him. I know there are churches called after him on both sides. I know there are Orange Lodges called after him. I know there's a day called St. Patrick's Day. My first memory of St. Patrick's Day would probably be my mother took me to have my photograph taken on St. Patrick's Day and a lovely green ribbon. I used to have ringlets and lovely green ribbon and all. But I really don't know a great lot about St. Patrick. And I was saying to someone recently, I was speaking in the House of Lords a number of years ago and helped to form a group over there called Champ and we have a big day on St. Patrick's Day. And, uh, I was asked to speak at it and I said, here's some breaking news from Northern Ireland. 
and everybody, there was a couple of hundred in the room, everybody stopped. Mm -hmm. I said, number one, we all believe God's on our side. Whatever side we're on, God's on <laughs> our side. We all believe St. Patrick's our saint, whatever side we're on, and we all love George Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> so there's three things we, we agreed on right away. But as far as St. Patrick's concerned, I mean, I know he's a saint, I know it. And I've read a little of his history, how he came as a slave and all that. But I have to say, to be perfectly honest with you, it has never really had a great impact in my life. Do you see him as a unifier? Is there something... Oh, yes. I mean, if you read the history of him, reconciliation was a big thing. Yeah. It was a big thing that he came to bring people together. And I like that. I like that. I think this, you know, that's what we need in Northern Ireland. We need people to come together. And that's why I'm so interested in integrated education. So, yes, I see that. I mean, there's a lot of uh, things. Uh, commitment's one of the things that is very often talked about about St. Patrick. Uh, you know, and I believe we have to make a commitment. So there's a lot of things when I read his story and read his life, there's a lot of things I would say, yeah, we need some more like that. Uh, but there are a lot of people out there doing a lot of good work. I don't know whether it's a tribute to St. Patrick or not. But at the end of the day, I mean, uh, as a, I go to America, for instance, in St. Patrick's Day, and, and they, they just love it. We don't pay the same thing to it. Some see the, I mean, you touched on it a moment ago, but some see the patron saint as, as simply for one community. What, what would you say to that? Well, yes, you're quite right. I mean, for many, many years, it would, it would always be seen as a Catholic, Catholic thing. And I think, and the fair play to the Catholic community, I think they have actually made more of St. Patrick than we have ever had. But I think that's slowly changing. And as I said earlier, I am aware there are orange lodges and all called after St. Patrick. And you know, it would be great if, that, if he became the symbol of reconciliation, that would be absolutely marvelous. Do you think that is changing? Do you think oh, there's yes. a move there? Oh, that's changing, yes, yeah, yeah. More and more you see, you see that happening, and more and more people talk more at ease about St. Patrick. Uh, even the very fight to get it off as a holiday, you know, people are beginning to move that way, and I think people are just fed up with all this histrionics that we have to deal with here in Northern Ireland. Forgiveness is a big part yeah. of St. Patrick's ministry, um, uh, and he forgave those who, who kidnapped him. <coughs> uh, but on a day to day basis, we all find forgiveness very, very hard. Well, it isn't, it isn't, Stephen. I mean, it, you know, sometimes people say that, but, you know, I always say to myself, you know, if I walked a mile in that person's shoes, how different I would, would I be any different? But I think the same way. And when you listen to people, uh, particularly people who, young people who I work among now, who've got themselves in desperate situations with mental health and all that, you know, we've got to have a bit more reconciliation and forgiveness in us. We've got to have it. And if we're, if we're true Christians, which we claim to be, then it would be an obvious thing for me. And do you think St. Patrick is relevant today? Do you think there's anything we can learn from him? Oh, yes. And I think, I think that is one of the good things about a centre like this. You know, people can come here and, and, and learn the history. But I, I think, you know, it's not taught enough, for instance, in Protestant schools. It's probably part of some kind of history in a Catholic school. And that's one of the things in, in integrated education we try to teach the whole round of history. And I think as that comes about, you'll find more and more and more people will take an interest in that. Do you think that's a mistake if, if Protestant schools have, have, have centred themselves? Well, from, absolutely. From because I think that has made it more a Catholic thing. I mean, it, uh, one of the things about a Catholic school is it's Irish history is taught in it. One of the things about a state school, a Protestant school, it's British it's history. history. Mm -hmm. I mean, most Protestants could tell you the kings and queens, but they couldn't tell you anything else. And it's the same on the other side, they could probably tell. I think we've got to change that, and we have got to open that up. So we have, it's no longer them and us. I think Northern Ireland is such a small place. I think, you know, I think we have to learn. To and in that. terms of your work with integrated education, where do you see that going? Well, integrated education, uh, we have a, I mean, we're at it now in nearly 40 years, and people say to me, oh, but you're still only 7%, which is quite right. There's a reason for that. The reason is there's not enough places. Last year alone, we know for a fact we turned away nearly 3,000 children because there simply was nowhere for them. Our schools are all, nearly all oversubscribed and you know, we're, we're now working towards uh, bringing schools together, which will be, make economic sense of nothing else, but we're now looking at that, you know, 
to, 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 to integrate my school and we, we done a little program because it wasn't known that parents in a school could take a vote as to whether they wanted the school to become integrated. To change the status. To change the status. But we made that known and fortunately for us, Liam Neeson, who's a big supporter of integrate, Liam made a lovely video for us. And the whole thing has just taken off. At the moment, they've had several schools both go through. In fact, I was at one yesterday, Harry Memorial on, on the Creative Road, and uh, we have another seven going through the voting at the moment. There's a legal thing around that to take a vote, and it has to be a number in the votes and, and all that. And that takes a couple of years. That's why I'm so keen about fundraising, because we have to fundraise all that work. We have to pay for our staff. We get no government money at all, and no integrated school was ever started by the government. None. It was all started by parents. We talked earlier about um, the House of Lords. You've, you've stepped away from the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. Do you miss it? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was nearly 20 years in the House of Lords, and I have to say the first year I went in, I was terrified. I didn't really know why I was there, uh, but it's a most fascinating place to work, and you can really can do a lot of things for Northern Ireland. That's why I was there. I wasn't there about me. I was there about people in Northern Ireland, and I miss it. And the big thing I miss about it is the gossip, <laughs> <laughs> because you're always sure to get a wee nugget about somebody. As I said to you before, I don't think you miss gossip at all. I think gossip circulates around when you. When I worked in the mill, it thrived on gossip, <laughs> and. Uh, the House of Lords is not not unlike that. I was right? just going to say there are quite a lot, of, probably quite a lot of similarities. Absolutely, and uh, I miss that. But no, seriously, I, I miss uh, the work. But I still, I, I'm over in London one, one or two days every month. I'm still involved in a lot of things in London. I still drop in to uh, Westminster and see my friends. And uh, Baron Ritchie has just taken my desk, so there's no going back. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a wonderful place. I think you need to go back and take your desk back. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful place to work. And you, you can really make a lot of difference. I mean, when I was in the House of Lords, one of the first things I was able to do was bring Sure Start to Northern Ireland. At the time of 39, Sure Start's all over Northern Ireland. And there's still a lot more work to be done. And what do you think of politics at Westminster at the moment? They're rubbish. <laughs> in what sense? Well, when I first went into Parliament, I knew a lot of people in, in, in the Commons who were there to help people. All of a sudden, it seemed to have gone around, and it's, it's professional people, lawyers, and all going in now as MP, and they're only out for themselves. Yeah. And, and you know, if you, if you take the prime minister, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying earlier, I have a sister; she's eighty-eight. There's only me and her left out of the seven of us, and my sister couldn't understand how this man could be president of the United States and our prime minister. <laughs> She thinks it's not the same person. The problem is, she's not that far off. <laughs> You're a great Labour person. You've, oh, always, yeah. you've always been Labour. Um, and Labour have their own particular difficulties oh, yeah. at the yeah. moment. Um, what's your assessment of what's going on there? Well, the Labour Party has torn itself apart. And basically, yes, before Corbyn arrived, I mean, the Labour Party were either a brownite, a blairite, whatever it, and... Uh, I never could understand that. I thought we all worked together for the for the good of the people. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is when Corbyn came in, uh, I had great hopes, I have to say, for Gordon Brown. I thought Gordon Brown, but it didn't work out that way. And uh, when Corbyn came in, it was almost immediately that he was going to destroy the Labour Party. And I mean, it's five years in office as per that. Is the Labour Party now will be years and years and years and years of ever getting back to any status. And uh, it's only the Labour Party will fight for ordinary working people's rights. I mean, the Conservative Party couldn't care less. So for me, it's a sad day when you see the Labour Party in disarray the way that some very talented people within the Labour Party, uh, in both in the House of Lords and the House of Commons. But having said that, everybody, when I was there, every. Everybody was joining one side or the other, and I couldn't understand that. I thought we were a group together working for the good of people. And there's a lot of work to be done out there, a lot of work. As I've already said about mental health and all, I mean, there are issues that, uh, that I don't even understand. Now, there are young people's issues and drugs and all that kind of thing. I mean, when I was young, my mother would have brought you in, and that was the end of that. But that doesn't happen now. And I helped to run a big Sure Star program, and you see those, those problems 
even from that very early age. But thank God, sure starts early. It is working. But in, in the Labour Party in England, I think after after Blair's success, and after Gordon Brown, and then all the debacle of, of, of different people standing and all, it just all fell away. And I just don't don't know when it will ever get back. Are there any of the current leadership candidates that you have faith in? I think Keir Stammer's a good man now. And Keir also played a big part in the peace process here. Uh, he's a good man. Whether or not he would be able to bring the party together or not, I don't know. I think they're just too fragmented at the moment. And everybody will have their own wee party that they're going to support. And unfortunately, Corbyn and uh, McDonald, that's the way it went. The like Liam McCluskey, who headed up my own union for a number of years, was so divisive. And I never can understand that. Life's hard enough without making problems. And what about the Labour Party in Northern Ireland? What's your sense of... Well, the Labour Party, I'm the president of the Labour Party in Northern Ireland. I, you know, we wanted to run candidates, not, not for a Westminster, we wanted to run candidates for local elections. The Labour Party in England wouldn't allow us. Everything you went to do, they wouldn't allow it. Oh, we'll have to take that vote, but we'll have to, that's never been decided. And basically, they have just more or less left the Northern Ireland Labour Party floundering. So they have, but, you but know, the, do you think the, there's enough support there to get an assembly seat? No. No, because again, the Labour Party in Northern Ireland is pulling itself apart. And uh, you, you, don't, you don't do that unless everybody moves forward together. So is it worth pursuing, or is, is it the well, end it's of worth the world? pursuing, oh yes. Because I think you have to get people that have a, a vote. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the DUP started, and there was only Ian Paisley. Look where they went. Uh, John Hume and people like that. I mean, visionaries. People who actually led their lives on the line. And we don't seem to have that quality of people now, and that worries me. And what about closer to home? What about Stormont? It's back after three years. What are your thoughts? Well, Stormont's back, and... and uh, I always said it would go back when it did because nothing concentrates your mind like a hanging. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were heading into an election which they, both major parties could have done very poorly. I mean, if you look at the SDP, uh, SLDP, sorry, the SDLP's results in the Westminster election, that proved what's possible. A lands here was on, on the uprise, and I think the two major parties were afraid of, the, of an election that, that could cost them a lot. The problem is that. I'm just a bit worried. They're back now and everybody seems to love each other and everybody seems to be agreeing. I'm just wondering how long that will last because very often Stormont just disintegrates into megaphone diplomacy. You shared it me and I shared it you. And there's so many problems in Northern Ireland that we need to be serious and get down. There's not enough money to do all the things these people are promising. And we have to get down and really think the thing through. If you take education, for instance, we've far too many schools. We have about five thousand deaths, fifty thousand deaths we don't need. We have schools struggling with way under hundred pupils. And I don't mean just in country areas. You know, we have and you look at the health service, look at how far the nurses had to go to get any right recognition. They are they are difficult decisions for a local politician to say, yeah. I'm gonna close that school Absolutely. down the road. That's, yeah. that's not a vote winner. No, no, I mean I, I understand, and the same, the same I understand with, it. And the same with hospitals. You're not closing my school, but you can close the one up the road if you like. Yeah. yeah. That, but that we have to come away from that because we don't have enough money to do all this. And we have to get real about it. And Northern Ireland I often say when I'm when I say that Northern Ireland is such a lovely place. And you know, there's not a, there's only about two million people here. You know, and it, Lump itself, we went five times now. You know, we've got to get real in Northern Ireland. We've got to get real and, and realise... So in the long term, are you hopeful that Stormont is going to work? Yes, well, I was asked last week, actually, I was at an event, and I was asked, was I optimistic or pessimistic? And I, I said, the simple answer to that is, the people of Northern Ireland can't afford to be pessimistic. We've got to hope, and we've got to hope for a better future. And hopefully, hopefully, Stormont will be part of that. We're going to come to a close, we're going to come to some, some questions from the audience in a moment, but when you look back at your amazing life, from leaving school at 14 and working in the mill and working with communities, and the Women's Coalition, the Peace Process, and the House of Lords, it is, and I'm sure hopefully the audience will agree, an incredible journey. Absolutely. And you've written about it. Um, do you have any kind of sort of life philosophy that has kept you going all the time? 
Well, I think I think because of where I was reared, the fact that I was reared in a, an area of mixed people, the fact that I was reared in poverty, the fact that you witness all those things, from, I think that forms you. I think that puts into your head. And I think, you know, the very fact that, yes, the hussy left school, yes, she went into work in the mill, yes, the mill closed down, and as one door closed, another door opened. And, you know, I very often say when I'm speaking to young people, you know, we all go through hundreds of doors a day. You just never know what's on the other side of the door. And I'm hopeful that, you know, we'll have a better tomorrow. But for myself, I mean, I've just had the most fantastic life. And I, I often say, you know, I'm just an ordinary woman who's had the most extraordinary opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, Baroness Blood. <laughs> we have time for some questions. So I'm sure there are some um, here. gentlemen here in the middle. Uh, Baron Esler, thank you. Uh, that was just fascinating and, and really inspirational. I'm intrigued by someone who left school at 14 and talking about how really your education came through the union, mm -hmm. uh, being so passionate about education. Uh, and I, I suppose I can see a line in one sense, but I, I'd love to know what got you so uh, passionate about education uh, and integrated education in particular? Well, I'll tell you what it is. All my life, I have felt the loss of an education. Uh, and particularly when I went into the House of Lords, I found that, you know, uh, there was a lot of things going on that I just didn't fully understand. Even when I went into the House of Lords first, I wouldn't have even knew how to plug a computer in. I had to learn all that. And when I went into the House of Lords, I was over 60. You know, and one of the things I have learned in the, in the last 20 odd years is education is the future for our young people. It's your passport. And I say that when I'm out speaking to young people. Get a good education behind you because it will always stand to you. I wasted mine. I wasted my years of education, something I deeply regret. But if it's in my power to even get one young person to take that on board, then I think I've fulfilled that mission. Okay, gentlemen here. Ernest very blood, uh, I find you an amazing individual. And I want to ask you, what is your opinion on the Irish language, please? Yes, it's really quite simple. I think if people want to speak Irish, that's perfectly all right with me. In the same way, people want to speak Ulster Scots, which I've never fully understood. That's perfectly all right. But I do not think that it needs to be put down in legislation. I was thinking just particularly, and I have to be perfectly honest with you, I was coming down a road today and all the streets had double name English and the Irish name. And I often think to myself, I travel quite a bit and I've been all over the place, but I have never seen that. Even even in, in London, you don't get that dual names on, on, on streets and that. And I often think, I wonder what our visitors makes of that. Now, I have no problem. And you know, it's interesting because it was actually Presbyterians who kept the Irish language alive. Very much. And I'm a Presbyterian. And, uh, you know, I would be all for that. And if people want to learn Irish, I have absolutely no problem whatsoever with it. None. But I do think it's being used as a weapon. And I think that's wrong. That's wrong. That the, the people who are doing that are simply devaluing their own, their own language. And I don't think that's right. So I don't. Thank you. Any, any more? Oh, one at the front? Oh, no, no, you're not allowed. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question? What? Can I, can, it's, it's more of a, a repetition. Over dinner, you had mentioned that there was a difference between the time when you had the, pe the reaction of the people on the Shankill Road when you received your CBE and when you received your peerage. Could you tell us a wee bit about that? Yes, when I got the MBA in 1995, I got it for industrial relations. And I remember when I went to the palace, the Queen was fascinated that a woman would be involved in labour relations, which tells you a sign of the times. But the interesting thing about it is, you know, uh, I got the most horrendous hate mail, all from inside the shankle. Uh, oh, you're looking after yourself. Oh, you're lining yourself up for a good job. And it really was. It went on for weeks, and it was it, it, it could have put you off. And uh, you know, there was a number of things happened in my car, and I was wrecked, and different things like that. Uh, but when I got the title, when I was offered the title, I remember um, saying to myself, "Well, my God, if they went mad over the MBE, what will they be if they didn't get the title?" <laughs> The interesting thing was it was the exact opposite. The people in the shankle just took it to them and the number of people in the shankle who said to me it was as if the Queen had given it to them. 
because I was one of them. And I think, you know, that has proved true. Uh, that has proved so many times the title. And, and, and I was asked once by somebody like him, uh, <laughs> do they call you Baroness on the Shankle? I says, no, they call me a whole lot of things, but I'm not <laughs> Okay, any more questions before we wrap things up? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming tonight, and maybe a, a final round of applause for Barnes. <laughs> Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, I um, would just like to thank both of uh, our speakers for tonight. Thank you, uh, Stephen and Baroness. Uh, I have got a, a present for both of you. Okay. Oh, uh, from, <laughs> from the centre. Um, so I'll come up and give these to you now. Baroness, thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, so thank you Tim. Thank you. And Stephen has been so, here so often, we're kind of running out of gifts for him. <laughs> so, uh, but we've got something that we hope that you're going to enjoy. That's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as always, folks, we do have canapes and drinks and wine and all sorts of things afterwards. Um, for those of you who are on our mailing list, that's excellent. If you're not on the mailing list, please do see Keely as you leave. Uh, the next conversation is going to be between Father Darcy, um, who's going to be here, um, and um, we're also going to... Uh, have Joe Duffy, the RTE pre, um, oh, yeah, yeah. presenter, Joe Duffy. So, uh, Father Darcy in conversation with Joe Duffy. That's going to be on the 12th of March. Well, you'll, okay. you'll really enjoy Father Darcy. Father Darcy. He's a real character. Okay, so there we go. Thank you very much.